I'm happy to report that over the past few months, ZWO has gone through and updated their compatibility list for the ASA Air and DSLRs. And thankfully, my Nikon D780 is now fully tested to work on the ASA Air Plus. So today, I'm going to show you my full DSLR workflow if you've got an ASA Air. As you can see here on this list though, it's mainly only Nikon and Canon cameras that are supported. So I know a lot of you might be on Sony or maybe even Fuji or something like that. And in that case, you're kind of out of luck. But to be completely honest with you, I actually don't recommend using the workflow I'm going to show you today if you have a DSLR. That's because I find it to be a bit too cumbersome still. And frankly, I would still rather control my DSLR the old fashioned way just by using the buttons on it and the screen, because to me, that's a bit easier. And right now I'm sure there's a few of you thinking, okay, well, I'm just gonna skip this video then. But I'd still recommend you hang in there because there are some really important tips that I'll give you along the way. And even if you aren't gonna be doing this workflow, you might still learn something valuable. Before we go any further, I wanted to mention that this video was originally recorded for my Deep Space course over on HowTube. And that course now has over 100 videos that should teach you almost everything you need to know. And because there are so many videos now, I figured nobody's really gonna care if I release a few for free here on YouTube. So with that said, if you wanna learn even more about deep space astrophotography and you like this video, be sure to head over to howtube.com and check out my deep space course. With all that out of the way, let's get started. The first thing you need to do is find a USB cable that will connect your DSLR to the AS Air Plus. And hopefully you still have the USB cable that was shipped with your DSLR because that should work the best. Then again, if this cable is too short, that could really cause problems later tonight. So you wanna make sure that whatever cable you're using, it's more than long enough to not get snagged. And unfortunately, when I was recording this tutorial last night, I ran into a problem. The USB cable I chose seemed to work fine, but for whatever reason, it would not properly connect my D780 to the AS Air Plus. And the only way it could solve this problem where the two can communicate is to grab a different USB cable. And once I plugged in the new cable, that solved the problem. So if you have any issues throughout this workflow, that would be my number one concern, is that the USB cable you're using to connect the DSLR to the ASA Air might not be the best cable. So you wanna try a different cable before you do anything else. After you've connected your USB cable from the DSLR to the ASA Air Plus, you also want to hopefully have an auto guider because this will make your star tracker or go-to mount track much more accurately. And this brings us to how to safely attach your auto guider to your setup. And this is another issue I have with the DSLR workflow is that there's really no good way to attach an auto guider to your setup unless you have a telescope with a handlebar or any other way to attach the auto guider to it. But if you're like me, you're still using a camera lens rather than a telescope. And in that case, there's really no good way to attach the auto guider to your telephoto lens. So what I've done, and I've showed this in some older videos, is I grabbed this little Arca Swiss clamp, which you can find in the products tab below the video here on HowTube. And then with this Arca Swiss clamp, you're also gonna need an L bracket for your DSLR. Essentially, the clamp will clamp onto the L bracket. And then using this little screw here, that's going to screw into the guide scope itself. And in this way, you'll have a very secure connection from the guide scope to your DSLR. But just by looking at this, you can tell that it's gonna be unbalanced and too heavy on the one side. This isn't gonna be that big of a deal for me tonight because I'm using a harmonic mount, which has a very powerful motor and it really doesn't care if things are unbalanced. But if you're using a Skyguider Pro, for example, or a Star Adventure, this could ultimately cause tracking issues because things are a little bit out of whack. And unfortunately, there's really no good solution because you could always add weight to the opposite side of the DSLR, like even duct taping a wrench or something if you want to be really basic about it. But the more weight you add, the more stress on the motor. So that's not a good idea either. The end result here is just that this will work temporarily as you progress through your astrophotography journey. But ultimately, you might want to consider getting a telescope that has an easy way to mount an auto guider. And then eventually you can even get a dedicated astro camera to replace the DSLR. And that should give you much higher quality images down the road. Getting back to the auto guider itself, all I need to do is connect a USB cable from the auto guider to the ASI Air. And because I'm using a go-to mount, I don't need to worry about the ST4 cable, which kind of looks like an ethernet cable. 
However, for those of you using a SkyGuide or Pro or a Star Adventure, you will want to connect that ST4 cable from the back of the AutoGuider into your Star Tracker. That way the guiding will work as intended. For this video though, I'm going to be using a ZWO AM5 mount, and that's mainly what we're going to focus on. If you still have questions regarding this process, you can always go back and watch some of the other videos here in the Deep Space course, which cover how to do your guiding on a SkyGuider Pro or Star Adventure. At this point, we've safely attached our camera gear to the mount. We've attached the cables, including the power cables, to the battery. Everything should be ready to go. We can now turn on a battery, turn on the AM5 mount or whatever mount you have, and then turn on the ASR Plus and our DSLR. When you turn on your DSLR, you want to make sure you have it set up correctly. That way it can properly communicate with the ASA Air. And that means the camera needs to be on manual mode or bulb mode if you're on a Canon camera. For those on Nikon, what we want to do is put the camera on manual mode and then use the shutter speed dial to put the shutter speed to bulb, which is normally past 30 seconds. And that's really the main thing is that you have it set to the bulb mode and then you're also shooting in RAW. The ASA Air will have a dialog message later on in the workflow that'll tell you exactly what you need to do, but that's the basics. And this brings us to the first problem I have with the ASA Air Plus and our DSLR. There aren't as many controls as I'd like there to be. For example, there's no way to control the aperture through the app. So what you want to do before you go any further is get your camera configured for the rest of the night. For example, I'm going to be shooting probably at 200 millimeters because that's the most zoom I have on this lens. So I might as well zoom into 200 right now. Then I can turn on live view on my camera, zoom in on any star, and then focus on it. Make sure I turn off any sort of vibration control and autofocus. And if I haven't done so already, adjust my aperture to wide open, in this case, f2.8. We will be able to adjust the ISO and the shutter speed through the app, but usually you can't touch the aperture, at least as of September 2022. Okay, assuming you've got everything taken care of, we can now go to our smartphone or tablet, change the Wi-Fi network to the ASR Plus, and then once we're connected, we can start up the ASR app on our device. The first thing I want you to do when the ASR app loads is just double check that the latitude and longitude over on the left are correct. I've got my coordinates slightly blurred out, but you can still make out the big numbers there. I'm around 48 degrees north and 120 something degrees west, I believe. If you're not sure what your latitude and longitude is, then you can use any app you want to figure that information out. And usually your phone or tablet is able to automatically input that information, but sometimes there's a glitch and it doesn't work, so you might have to input it manually. As long as you're fairly close, that'll be fine. Okay, now we can go over to the right-hand side, and I've got the ZWO AM5 mount already selected up here. And then down below that, we have our main camera, which again, today should be the Nikon D780. We've also got fields for the main scope focal length and the guide scope focal length. Now this is another area where it gets kind of confusing because I might start off the night at 70 millimeters to get everything ready, but then I zoom in to 200 millimeters to take my photos. So what you want to do right now is turn on your headlamp, look at your lens and see what the current focal length is. And then you can enter that information right here. Don't get too worried about this though, because we can always go back and change it later on here in the app. When you get inside the main user interface, the first thing I want you to do is click on the camera icon at the top of the screen. This will bring up our main camera settings. And this is where we can change the ISO, customize some of the settings, and things like that. I do recommend that you save image to DSLR simultaneously. That way these photos will still be saved on your SD card on your camera. Otherwise, everything's going to be stored only on the ASI Air, and that just makes it more cumbersome later on. Now that we've looked at the main camera settings, let's go back to our main preview window here, and then we can change the exposure to three seconds roughly and take a photo. This will allow us to see if our image is focused and roughly what we're aiming up to. Then I can use the pinch and zoom with my fingers on the screen to zoom in and see how things look. My stars look nice and sharp, so that's a good sign. Next, let's click on the plate solve button on the left. This should bring up a dialog window and if you're still not familiar with plate solving, basically the ASA Air Plus is able to figure out your camera's sensor size as well as the field of view from your lens or telescope. And with those two numbers, it can analyze what stars it's looking at and give you an idea of where your camera's aimed up to. However, you can see that it's taken 50 seconds and it still isn't working, which tells me there's a problem. 
when I looked at my camera and lens, I realized that I'm not actually at 70 millimeters, I'm at 200. That's why it wasn't working. So I go into my main camera settings, I change the main scope focal length to 200. Now when I go through and do the plate solve, it should actually work, hopefully. Anyway, let's continue on with the workflow. We know our stars are sharp, we've got everything aimed up towards Polaris roughly. Now we can click on preview and change it to PA for polar align. Once we click on the play button here, it will now go through and take a photo with our camera aimed up towards Polaris. Now it's gonna plate solve. You shouldn't have any issues here, and if it works properly, just click on next. This is where you wanna watch out though, because the mount will now start rotating down about 60 degrees. And if your USB cable isn't long enough, it might get snagged right here and cause a big problem, which is why I sat right next to the mount and I watched that USB cable as it was rotating to make sure it didn't get snagged. Anyway, it's gonna go through and take a second photo now and it will analyze how the stars have rotated between the two images. Based on this rotation, it knows how bad your polar alignment is, and it tells us right there on the right. I need to go up 36 minutes, 25 arc seconds, and to the left, 49 arc minutes, 30 arc seconds. If you're not familiar with degrees and arc minutes and arc seconds, these are really small, precise adjustments, so I'm already pretty darn close to a perfect alignment. All I have to do now is adjust the altitude and azimuth screws on my base to correct for those errors that we see here. Again, I need to go to the left and up just a little bit. Once I've made my adjustments on the screws, I'll click on refresh at the bottom of the screen and see how my error improves or maybe it gets worse. And all you have to do is keep adjusting your altitude and azimuth screws, clicking on refresh and seeing how the error changes. If you can get your total error down to five arc minutes or less, that's good enough, I would say. But of course, the closer, the better. If you're like me and you get it really close, but the ASA or software still isn't happy, you know, it wants you to get even better, then you can always click on the stop button on the right and say, you know what, I'm done for tonight. It's good enough. Because otherwise it's gonna make you go until you have, I think like two arc minutes or less of error. And then at that point it will say, congratulations. But I already spent enough time, so I stopped it. And then I changed from PA back to preview, which is kind of our main window here in the interface. With the polar alignment completed, the next step is to find the object that we want to photograph. And we can do that very easily by clicking the Sky Atlas button in the lower left hand corner. Kind of looks like the Big Dipper. This brings us into the Sky Atlas window and we can see where our camera is currently aimed up to with that blue square. The red square is where we want the camera to go. And if I want to photograph the Andromeda Galaxy, I can get it lined up just like so. And the really cool thing here is that the red square is your actual field of view based again on your camera's sensor size and the focal length of your lens. For those of you that don't know how to find your objects manually, then you can always click the magnifying glass on the left to bring up what's called tonight's best. And this will just list a lot of different objects that you can photograph if you want to. Alternatively, you can click the three lines in the upper right corner and choose my favorites list, which I already picked out a lot of great objects that are easy to photograph. And in your case, you'd have to do that yourself. But anyway, once you've either found the object manually or through the interface here, click on the go to cross button there in the lower right. And if you've got a go to mount, it will now automatically move your camera directly to this location. And I gotta say, this is really a nice feature with the ASA Air and the AM5 mount. This is just a seamless workflow and it makes astrophotography so much simpler, especially having come from using a SkyGuider Pro for many years. When it's got the composition lined up properly, it will give you a little update. And then at this point, we've got our object centered up in the frame. We can always adjust the composition slightly if we need to, but that's really the basics to it. Anyway, assuming you've got your object found, we'll click the back arrow in the top left corner of the screen to get to our preview window. Now, I'd recommend taking a 30 second long photo. When this image completes, we can just verify that we actually see the object we're trying to photograph whether that's Andromeda or any one of the various nebular galaxies in the night sky. When our 30 second photo completes, it will now transfer the image to our smartphone. But if you're using a very high megapixel camera, this could take a while. So we'll sit here and wait, and there we go. It has automatically stretched the data, and we can see the Andromeda galaxy right here. The stars look a little bit soft though, and that's something I've tried to stress throughout the deep space course, is that your telescope or lens will shift slightly 
as it gets colder, the focusing elements. And so that's why you have to go out every 10, 15, or 20 minutes, stop the shooting, refocus your lens, and then begin the shooting again, especially if it gets colder throughout the night. Because if you just focus once at the beginning of the night and don't touch it again, it's very possible that after 20 minutes, all your photos are gonna be blurry for the rest of the night. The ASIR does have a few different ways to help you focus in real time. However, I think these are all fairly cumbersome and they might actually put a lot of shutter clicks on your camera, which will reduce the lifespan of the camera if it's taking a lot of one second long photos. This is another reason why I prefer to use the live view on the back of the camera to focus. I just find it easier and faster. Now, if you still wanna use the ASIR to help with your focusing, that's fine, but I'd recommend you stick with just the normal old preview window. Because as you can see here, the focus window, the live window and everything else don't really work that well. But if we put it back to preview, we can just take maybe a three second long photo, zoom all the way in and see if the stars are blurry. If so, we adjust our focus ring very slightly and take another image. And you just keep doing that until the stars are as sharp as possible. And if you're really having trouble at this stage, I'd highly recommend getting a Batnov mask if you don't have one already. I did some videos probably two years ago now that talk about some Batnov masks you can purchase for a camera lens and they work really well. So you might want to consider purchasing one of those and I'll have a link for that in the products tab below the video. At this point, we've done our polar alignment. We've got our object centered up in the frame. The stars are nice and sharp. Now we can begin our guiding. So what you want to do is click on the guide button on the left. When the graph pops up, just click on it once. That'll bring you to the guiding interface. This is very simple. Just click on the begin looping arrows over on the right to begin taking photos with your auto guider. Click the begin guiding crosshair button and it will automatically choose a selection of stars and then it will automatically begin the calibration. From here, you can sit back and relax and wait for the calibration to complete. But while it's running, I wanna talk about our guide settings, which you can see right here. I'm using the ASI 120mm Mini and the ZWO 30mm F4 guide scope. Again, these will be linked in the products tab below the video if you're watching on how to. And with that particular gear, these are the settings I use and they always work for me. Because this is the DSLR workflow, let's scroll down to the bottom of our guide settings and click on dither settings. I'd highly recommend if you've got a go-to mount and a DSLR, you turn on the dithering. This will help to reduce and remove the hot pixels in your photos, any sort of amp glow, banding, and more. And I'd recommend use the settings you see here on the screen. The RA only, you'd wanna turn that on if you have a SkyGuider Pro or Star Adventure, but to be honest, the dithering is not gonna work that well anyway on those trackers, so you might not even wanna bother. Dithering works best with the go-to mount. When we go to the guide stability settings, this will also affect the dither. And I've already done a full video on this if you wanna go watch that. But basically, uh, just use the settings you see here and that should work fine. Especially if you've got a decent go-to mount, this shouldn't give you any trouble. Again, the main reason we wanna do dithering with our DSLR is because there's no way to cool the camera's sensor down and that generates a lot of hot pixels, some banding, and amp glow. Especially if you're shooting with a heavy light pollution filter or your shutter speeds are kinda short. Either way, it's a good idea to try dithering on your next night out. If we go back to our main guiding window, we can see that the calibration is still running, but it's doing fine. I'm gonna click the two arrows in the top left corner though to go back to our other interface. This is where we've been working at for most of the night. And then from here, I'll click on preview, and change that to auto run. This is ultimately how we actually take photos with our DSLR. What you wanna do is click the three dots and the three lines over on the right, and that'll bring up our shooting schedule. The first thing I always do is change the target there in the upper left from FOV cross to whatever I'm photographing, in this case, the Andromeda Galaxy. If you have any previous shooting schedules from the nights before, you can delete those and we'll start over fresh. And all we have to do for that is click on the plus button to add a new shooting schedule. This is where we can choose between light, bias, flat, and dark, but of course we'll start off with our light frames. There is a fair amount of light pollution and the moon is up tonight, so I'm just going to shoot 60 second long exposures and I'll take 100 of them. And then I'll hit OK. That's all I have to do to get my camera configured. And now I can back out of this window, and it looks like our guiding has actually completed the calibration. So if I tap on the little graph there, that'll bring me back to the guiding interface. When I can see my blue and red lines, that's a good sign, but I like to click on the clear button in the lower left corner. 
that clears out the graph and lets it start over fresh. Everything looks good here though, so I'll click on the two arrows in the top left corner to back out of my guiding interface and get back to our shooting schedule in the auto run menu. You may have noticed a pretty heavy vignette in my preview photos, so this might be a good reason to take flat frames, which should automatically fix any sort of vignette and dust spots that might be in my images. And I can do that very easily here in the ASAR software. I'll just change the file mode to flats and then take maybe 20 of them. I can even set this to take a few dark frames as well. Just make sure that the shutter speed matches exactly between your dark frames and your light frames, and you're taking at least 20 dark frames. You can also take bias frames if you want to, but normally those aren't necessary for most of us. I'm also going to drag my dark frames over. That way it takes them immediately after my light frames. This is important because the dark frame sensor temperature has to match your light frame sensor temperature. And that's why you always want to take your darks right after your lights at the end of the night. Because if the sensor temperature doesn't match, the dark frames won't calibrate properly, and they might actually cause problems in your final image. And frankly, the flat frames, there's no way I can do them tonight anyway, so I'm going to delete those, and I'll worry about them the following morning. From here, though, we're just about ready to go. We're taking all of our light frames and our dark frames at the end of the night. I just got to remember to go out there and put my lens cap on before the dark start. And then I can go back to my main auto run window here, click the circular button on the left, and it will begin taking my photos. The guiding is running with a total error of about one arc second, I believe, which is really nice. That means I'm going to have really sharp stars. I could probably even shoot five minute long exposures without a problem. So this is the part in the workflow where you can finally sit back and relax for a few minutes, wait for your first image to complete, and then when it does, it will update the preview. From there, you might want to zoom in and make sure the stars are still sharp, the composition looks good, etc. As the first image finally loads up on my smartphone, the initial thing that I'm noticing is the very heavy vignette, which is very distracting. You might also notice that the guiding graph shows a dither, which means it moved my composition slightly in a random direction, and it's going to take my second photo. When I zoom into the image, the stars look pretty sharp, and I don't have any problems with that. But if your stars are a little bit blurry, I'd recommend you click on the pause button on the right, which will stop the image capture, and then you're going to want to refocus your lens before you go any further, if there's a problem. If you do that though, the guiding is going to freak out because it's so sensitive to any sort of movement. So for those of you that need to refocus your lens in the middle of your shooting schedule, you also need to go into the guiding and stop it, or else you'll encounter problems. For that, you'll just click on the graph, click on stop to stop the guiding, then you can go back to your main interface window here, you might even want to switch over to the preview window, refocus your lens. When you verify that the stars are nice and sharp after taking a few preview photos, then you can go back, click on the guiding graph, begin looping, begin guiding, and then once the guiding looks okay, go back to the auto run menu, click on the start button again, and begin taking the rest of your photos. As I stressed earlier in the video, it's really important that you check the focus of your image every 15 or 20 minutes if the temperature is dropping throughout the night, especially if you don't have a dew heater, because these small temperature changes could make your stars blurry faster than you might expect. And if you don't catch it, you're going to be wasting a lot of time capturing blurry data. And I have found that using a dew heater tends to actually help with this problem because that little warm band around your lens keeps the lens at a constant temperature. And ultimately, that should prevent the focus from shifting throughout the night. And that's all I've got for you in today's video. I've walked you through my full DSLR workflow using the ASA Air. Really, the main reason I'd recommend doing this is for that Sky Atlas feature, provided you've got a go-to mount, because that's going to make finding the objects so much easier. But when it comes to actually taking your photos, I still recommend doing it the old-fashioned way. Just set that all up through an external remote or your camera's menu. And for me, that's the ideal way to do things. But if you want to use the ASAR for everything, I understand, and now you know exactly what to do.